ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم خذ العفو وأمر بالعفو وأعرض عن الجاهلين وإما ينزغنك من الشيطان نصر فاستعذ بالله إنه سميع عليم رب الشرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وحد العقدة من لساني يقهر قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين uh, once again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, um, I was sitting in the wrong hall, and, uh, and I just kind of realized that this is the place I'm supposed to be. So, there was a lot of awkward moments between the jog from there to here. Because on the way, Come on, Nikhar, can I picture with you? I said, no, you can't right now because I'm late. And then the guy's taking a running picture, and, and then, like, then they wouldn't let me in from here. And I'm like, anyway. So the lecture is supposed to actually be about the trickery of Shaitan and the, the plot of Shaitan. And before we talk about that a little bit, it's, it's a vast topic because Allah dedicates quite a bit of ayat, quite a bit of ayat uh, to the subject matter of Shaitan. Uh, a number of scholarly works have been done on Tadbis, Tadbis, the disguises that Shaitan takes, right? They are, they are obvious and apparent attacks, and they are more subverted, subversive attacks. And instead of giving you an overview, I personally am not a fan of overviews. I'll tell you why. And I'll also tell you something else that's going to be different about this year's convention, at least as far as I'm concerned. I try to come to these conventions and I try to keep my talks motivational. Uh, and I've done that for a few years. But I think, and I sense, that the level of maturity of our community has increased. And I think people can handle heavier subjects now. And this is one of the real reasons I'm really, really happy that our dear brother Hamza is here all the way from Europe. Because he will like make your brain, like your cells kind of work hard. To keep up, and it's good. It's it's a good thing for you. We've heard enough of the same. We need to kind of elevate our discourse in every way that we can, inshallah. So I was thinking about what to talk to you about, and I and I know you've heard plenty of khutub and talk and lectures about Shaitan and you know his attacks and how we have to be careful of it and all of these things. So I wanted to address something that actually I was talking to uh, from a linguistics perspective with my advanced students. So these these students of mine in the Dream Program, they're two weeks away from graduating, so we read advanced texts in Tafsir and linguistic text, and I explain some of the benefits that is like found in these technical books. I'm not going to give you a technical lecture, but certainly, in order to hopefully understand what I'm trying to get across to you, you will need an extra set of, uh, like an extra bit of attention. And uh, one, of the atta one of the great attacks of Shaitan is to destroy your attention span. He's a constant distractor. And he, one of the attacks of Shaitan is called an nazr a nazr in Arabic, which is actually agitation. And it shares root letters, two of them with nazr. Nazar actually means to pull something. Nazar to pull, and nazar to poke at someone or to pull someone to agitate them. Right? So he's constantly agitating you to think about something else. When you're thinking about something else, he wants you to think about something else. And from nazar, we learn something else. We learn from the word nazar, the attack of shaitan, that is, he wants you to get involved in too many things at the same time so that you end up accomplishing what? Nothing, nothing. So you can't actually, it's very difficult. A lot of people come nowadays and they say that I don't know how to focus. I just don't know how to do it. When I sit and study, I start thinking about my phone or I start thinking about a text message. When I look at a text message, an update comes on my Facebook page. So I start looking at that. Then somebody sends me a link to a video. So I start watching that. Then there's a link, you know, this related video. So I start watching those. Speaking of videos, I realize I haven't watched the third episode of that season. So I start watching that. And then the time's up and the exam's starting. And so, you know, I can't pay attention to one thing. So obviously, one of the visible devices of shaitan has become our mobile devices. You know, we, and you'll see me before a lecture, I'll be like sliding away on the phone and stuff, right? Because I'm actually looking up my app, I don't, I don't text people. I know I'm terrible at texting or at anything else for that matter. But I'm looking up certain ayat or you know, reading some things right before I come up and speak with you just to refresh myself. But in any case, there are, there are all of you have mobile devices with you at the moment and some of you are actually holding on to them right now and texting as I speak. I mean, I've, I've even seen one time I finished khutbah and I you know, got back home and somebody sent me a screen cap of oh, oh I'm sitting in a khutbah with Naman Li Khan. It's like a timestamp <laughs> update. From the, from the masjid itself with a picture of me giving khutbah, this is pretty sad. Like, you're, I mean, you're, in the, you're in the act of worship and you're worried about, you know, getting some likes on a picture. Or, you know, it's, it's sad. So, one of the first challenges, obviously, is attention span. Regardless, I'm going to push myself and I, inshallah ta'ala, by extension, push all of you guys to, to hopefully understand some of the more subtle things that are being talked about today, inshallah. So, one particular attack of shaitan that has to do with dealing with people. 
and has to do with dealing with people. There are two places in the Quran Allah uses the words. In Nahu, first of he says, وَإِمَّا يَنْزَغَنَّكَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ نَزَغْ نَزَغْ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Surah Al-A'raf. He says, if and when at all this happens, and by the way, the ma in ma yanzahannaka, the ma suggests this is a very com not un it's not a common situation. It's a very unusual situation if this might happen. And if, if it does happen, the shaitan is constantly ag agitating you with one of his agitating attacks. Yanzahannaka min shaitan does one. And it's not even a small attack, it's a pretty major attack. So we'll understand that attack in a little bit as I contextualize it, right? He says, فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ Then seek the refuge of Allah. Meaning, how, do, how does a Muslim seek refuge of Allah? أَعْرُضُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Then Allah says, إِنَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Which is easy enough, no doubt about it. He certainly is all-hearing and he's all-knowing. Right? So he mentions two of his names, إِنَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Almost an exact replica of this ayah occurs in Surah Fussila. Almost an, almost an exact replica. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَإِمَّا يَنْزَغَنَّكَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ نَزْغٌ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Slightly different. He says, if at all, if at all, an agitating attack of shaitan comes to you and it's a strong attack and it's getting at you, then seek Allah's refuge. So far it's identical, yes? What was the other surah? What was the other? I know who remembers. It's okay. I'll keep, I'll keep embarrassing you until you remember. What is it? A'raf. Very good. This one is surah Fusilat. This is Surah Fusila, 41, okay? So he says, if and when this attack comes to you, what do you, you do? Fasta'id billah, seek refuge of Allah. Identical so far. And he says, innahu huwa sami'ul alim. No doubt about it, he in fact, comma, he is the listening, the knowing. In other words, he added the he twice over. He said, innahu sami'ul alim in Surah Al-A'raf. But in Surah Fusila, he says, innahu huwa sami'ul alim. This is twice the emphasis on the presence of Allah. Because in grammatical terms they say, He mentioned himself as the predicate of a sentence, sentence twice, the, you know, subject of a sentence rather, twice, then the predicate. He, no doubt, he is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. And he mentioned a the on top, like the all-hearing, the all-seeing. As-Sami'a, Al-Alim, there's an Al on it. The previous ayah that I mentioned from Al-A'raf, Sami'un. Alimun. He hears, he sees, but he's not mentioned with Alamat Alim. It's not specified like that. So it seems to me that in one place Allah is telling us about the same exact shaitan and the same exact attack. It's exactly the same. But it seems to me that in one of them Allah emphasizes his presence that he's listening and he knows way more than the other one. He does this. And it leaves you a little bit baffled as a reader of the Quran because you know it's not just there to confuse the Hufal. Where, where was that hua and where was it missing? It's not just for that. There's actually very powerful reasons for this. Why Allah emphasizes something somewhere. And He mentions almost exactly the same thing somewhere else, but He doesn't emphasize it. And in these comparisons, this is how Allah explains His Quran. This is how we explain the ayat Allah Himself says. You know, and Nusarriful Ayat also listen. Allah, Allah, He says He changes the Ayat. You read the Tafsir of Nusarriful Ayat, we change the Ayat. You know what you find? Allah says something, then He says something almost identical. Almost identical. But He changes it a little bit. And that's His way of explaining Himself. So if you don't pay attention to those changes, you're going to miss a treasure. There's going to be a, this endless treasure that's going to be missed. Unfortunately, the reality of the Ummah today is we read the Qur'an, uh, the fortunate few that do read the Qur'an, we read it in a very linear way and we don't read it in a reflective, deep sort of way. And we don't look for, where, did, where else did Allah say this? Did He say it the same way? Is there a difference between this and that? And we don't, you know, we don't even emphasize this study anymore. Because the, most of the Muslims are just interested in give me a fatwa whether or not I can eat at McDonald's. Or, you know, just, you know, just give, me, give me a halal haram, just, you know, salam alaikum. That's all I care about. But to, Reflection on the Qur'an, it opens the mind of the Muslim. It changes the way we see the world around us. It opens up these doors to wisdom that will not come to an end. Hey, me too, I'll wait. Okay. Your, your daughter is looking for you. Okay, anyway. So, let's talk about these two ayat. Both of them have to do with da'wah. This is supposed to be allegedly a wise Islam session, so I'll talk about it in the context of da'wah. Both of these ayat I chose. I could have talked about any other attack of shaitan. I chose this one because both of these ayat have to do with what again? With da'wah, okay? Now, one place, Surah Al-A'ra, Allah Azza wa Jalla is telling His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, خُذِ الْعَفُوا خُذِ الْعَفُوا Interesting language, he says, grab on to forgiveness, grab on to pardon. Like pardon is a kind of slippery chicken that you're trying to grab and it's running away. You could have just said, Urfu, forgive. He didn't say forgive, he said grab on to pardon. There's a difference in language. 
Why is he grab on to pardon? Because if you say, oh, fool, forgive, and he forgives. But holding on to something suggests that it's slippery and it gets away. It's slippery and it gets away. And it also suggests that you don't have it, you have to go and what? You have to get it. You have to get it. So for example, if somebody tells you, good, eat, <coughs> eat, that actually even suggests that there's a plate in front of you. But if somebody says, خُذِ الطَّعَامَ وَخُذِ الْأَكْلِ Grab the food. Go grab the food. What does that mean? That means you don't have it, you have to go and what? Get it. You have to go and get it. And that suggests that this is going to require an effort. Even the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is being told there will be times when you're speaking to someone and they're going to be so obnoxious and they're going to be so ridiculous and they're going to be so offensive and their entire mission in life is to get under your skin so you lose your temper. So they will say terrible things about you and your prophet and your book and your God. They will say all kinds of things to just to try to agitate you because that's what they want. And guess what they're doing that on behalf of? They don't even know. What in my shaytani This agitation is coming. This guy is speaking, is spewing. Some of you have a, like a da'wah booth on your campus and some guy comes and starts spitting out all kinds of stuff about Rasulullah And you're sitting there, you're like 18 years old. Yeah. Kafir, I'll just show you, you know, it just, it begins, you know. What did, what did Allah tell His Messenger? I said, Khud al-Afu, Khud al-Afu, this is in the context of da'wah. First of all, hold on to forgiveness. Wa'mur bil urf. And then bring the conversation back to what everybody recognizes. In other words, don't talk to him about, he will try to talk to you about tangents. And he'll try to take the conversation in 30 different directions. Hey, by the way, in your tafsir of like Tabari, Tabari says that, you know, you're a prophet, blah, 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 blah. And you listen to all of that like, what, Tabari? What are you couldn't do? Do you even know who my mom Tabari was, dude? By the way, just by the way, those of you that are in the field, or you have non-Muslims that come up to you and mess with you, or a class you're taking, and Imam al-Tabari, rahimahullah, is mentioned, watch out. Imam al-Tabari was a historian. Imam al-Tabari was a historian, and his job was to collect anything that's ever been said about the Qur'an, right or wrong, he just collected it. He wasn't a mufassir, his tafsir is called tafsir al-Tabari, but it's really a collection of all manner of quotes, all manner of quotes, right or wrong, he said, this is what I'm hearing being said about the side. He didn't verify it, he didn't collect it, he was just saying historically, he wanted a record that in this century, these kinds of opinions about this ayah existed, whether right or wrong. Now, that becomes amazing ammunition for evangelicals or anti-Islamists or whatever, because they can find all kinds of crazy things in which tafsir, Imam al tabari and that's not his opinion, and nor is he saying this is what the Qur'an means, he's just saying, this is what people be saying about the Qur'an. Check it out. That's all he did, it was an encyclopedia of quotes. It was a collective, imagine it was like the old wiki. You know, it was an old collection of comments, archive. That's what it was. So, you know, we get all, oh, there was an imam, and he said that in his tefs here. Oh, how are we going to ever respond? But anyway, this guy is throwing tangents at you. And what does the ayah say? The ayah says, what more bil urf? Command to al urf. It's not even al ma'ruf, it's al urf. And al urf is actually more, it's less demanding than the word ma'ruf. Ma'ruf means, means that which is known. Everybody knows about it. But al urf is actually even more, you can, what, what you can call a social norm. Call to the norm. Call to the common ground. Look, I don't know what you're talking about, but let's talk about the right of the neighbor. Let's talk about decency. Let's talk about this God who created everything. The norm. Everybody knows about that stuff. Bring it back to the common elements. Don't complicate a conversation. You see, people who try to get under your skin, they love complicating conversations. And if you notice one thing about prophetic speech, it's always direct, to the point, and more, most important of all, it's simple. It's straightforward. It cuts to the point. It doesn't allow tangents. What more be wrong? Then the Prophet is told, alayhi salatu wasalam, wa a'rid anil jahileen, ignore, deliberately ignore people who can't control their emotions. Guy comes up to you, he's got jahad, jahad means, liddu'aqal, aqal means you can control your emotions, jahad means you can't control your emotions. Urdu speakers have some idea what jahad means, but jahilad means good, tamiz niya baat kar etc. When you say that, right, that's, that's kind of correct. Jahad means a guy who, uh, you know, who can't hold himself, he starts, you know, using foul language, starts getting loud, starts getting obnoxious, maybe even starts getting physical, starts his face, starts changing colors and all this stuff. That guy, you need to what? You need to do what with that guy? Get away from those people. Ignore them. This is not a time to talk to them. If they're going to turn into a gorilla, no, no point speaking to a gorilla. It's, it's just as productive as speaking to an actual gorilla. It's not, you're not going to get anywhere. 
to just leave it. Let it go. Maybe there'll be another chance when he's not so like so overtaken by Shaitan's waswasa. We'll find another time to talk. Right? So if he's really losing it, you just let go. Let, just let it go. Oh, I'm going to By the way, when people lose it, they get even more offensive, right? And when you're walking the wind, you're like, what's you? What are you, chicken? Huh? Can't handle my questions, huh? I thought so. All of you Muslims, huh? Take your Quran with you. Etc., etc. And then as you're walking the wind, what happens? What'd you say about that? Like, you know, like, you know? <laughs> And you turn to Allah, now I'm going to put the smack down on you boy, I'm going to teach you, so I'm going to use all my, I've prepared all the arguments to make you feel so stupid, and I'll put you in your place. And that's when this ayah comes up, And even when the shaitan starts agitating you, the ayah is to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even if, even if, you might even have the possibility, and the ma was used because it wouldn't happen with Rasulullah. The ma protects the Rasulullah from the waswasa of shaitan. Because he made a shaitan Muslim. That's why the ma is important. But he, by extension, all of us are covered. How are we covered? As you're walking away from the ignorant, does he get more aggressive or less aggressive? He gets more aggressive, which, which pokes at your ego. So Allah says to, to the messenger, listen, if that happens, then shaitan will come to you because shaitan likes to excite the ego. And at that point, just seek Allah's refuge. That's shaitan. That's the, the, the urge to want to go back and take him on, and take him down, and watch him be humiliated in public. That urge was not from Islam. That was from shaitan. That wasn't da'wah. That was your problem. So watch it. And seek the refuge of Allah, certainly he is listening. And knowing. It's pretty powerful. But that's Surah Al-A'raf. Where Allah mentioned that Allah hears and Allah See, so Allah hears what he said, Allah hears what you're going to say, Allah knows what he, is in his heart, and Allah knows what's in your heart. So if you turn around in arrogance, Allah will know the words might be of Islam, but the heart has nothing of Islam. On this note, before I go to the next ayah, Allah Azza wa describes a very powerful phenomenon in the Qur'an, a very deep statement in the Qur'an. Allah says, وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ Shaytan beautified their actions to them. Shaytan beautified their actions to them. People mostly understand this ayah in one way. They understand this ayah to mean there are things that are haram, like alcohol or partying or drugs or whatever, and shaitan beautified the haram for them. They beautify, you know, whether it's they're committing zina or they're lying or stealing or whatever, they're disrespecting elders, whatever they're doing, shaitan beautified it for them. But this ayah means something else also. This ayah also means when you're doing the work of deen, but you're doing it for the wrong reasons. When you're doing the work of what? What did I say? Of deen, of Islam. You're doing da'wah. You're praying, you're doing good stuff. But you're doing it for the wrong reasons, shaitan beautifies that too. Shaitan beautifies good deeds too. Because he doesn't care about the deed. What does he care about? That your heart should be corrupt. Once your heart is corrupt, you could outwardly be doing good things, but he knows it will mean nothing. So he'll beautify it to you, and you'll be delusional into thinking you're accomplishing great things. They will assume that they've accomplished incredible things. On the outside, everybody will think, oh, this guy's amazing, Dari, mashallah. They're doing so much work. They've accomplished so much, but you've accomplished nothing. Because in the heart, it was just the extension of one's pride. That's all there was. You know? Now turn to the other ayah in which Allah emphasizes his presence even more. Even more than the first one. Now the first one was hard because someone obnoxious came to you and you have to hold on to forgiveness like it's almost like Forgiveness is not the first thought that came to your mind when you heard this guy speak. So you had to hold on to it. Then you had to speak, but speak the decent thing. Stay on subject. And walk away when things get out of hand. All of this is extremely easy or extremely hard? This is extremely hard, but it's about to get a lot harder. Surah Fussilat, things get a lot harder. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَلَا تَسْتَوِ الْحَسَنَةَ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةَ First of all, remember the good and the evil are not the same. Good and evil are not the same. Well, what in the world does that mean, good and evil are not the same? Why even begin like that? That is teaching the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and all of us by extension, that not only are you to speak in a good way, not, not only is your message good, but the way you in which you deliver it is part of goodness. So somebody could be saying a terrible thing, but they have a nice way of saying it. And somebody could be saying wonderful things, but they have a <coughs> terrible way of saying it. Not only is our message supposed to be good, the way in which we deliver that message is supposed to be good as well. Because if you put any element of bad in your, in your message or in the way you deliver it, it will turn into something bad. 
Look, you can ask someone to pray. You can ask your younger son to pray. There's a nice way to ask, and there's a terrible way to ask. Son, it's lot time. You want to go pray together? Oh, I'm like, come on, come on, I'll get you some ice cream afterwards. It's a nice way to pray. Nice way to ask. Then there's you, Shaitan. You never make salat. <laughs> what else do you think you can do right now? Just go pray. Why are you so late, brother? How can you never pray? You're such a waste of space. I told you, mother, she, you, you're like his, her family. <laughs> <laughs> he caught you her side of the jeans or whatever. I mean, in both cases, you asked him to pray, but there's a way to say it. You see what I'm saying? It's not just what you say, but how you say it. So that's how the ayah begins. Then what does he say? He says, ahsan." Respond with what is better. Respond with the word, with al-kalima yani, ahsan." Respond with the word that is better. Respond with the answer that is better. What does that mean? That means the guy's coming, he's obnoxious like last time, he's cursing, he's using foul language, he's attacking Islam left, right, and center. You have to respond this time. Last time you could do what? You could walk away, you forgive, stay quiet, maybe you get to say one thing, but you walk away. This time, Allah is saying, no, you don't get to walk away, you gotta respond. Sometimes you're in a situation where you have to respond. You can't walk away. It'll be, the consequences of walking away sometimes are better, but the consequences of walking away, sometimes it could do more damage than good. Sometimes you have to stand your ground. What if there's a, you know, an imam or a speaker or a da'i, he's on TV, and he's being attacked on TV, you can't just take the mic off and walk away. So for millions of people, what does it look like? Islam didn't have a response. You can't always walk away. You have to respond. So this ayah is about a tougher situation. When you have to hold your ground, and you have to respond. Then Allah says, okay, now you have to respond. By the way, the guy was arrogant when you didn't respond. Imagine if you responded, does he get even more aggressive than before? He's like, oh, forget this. He's, he's exactly where I wanted him to be. Because he was looking for a response. These people, they love responses. Because then they can pick one thing out of your response, and they try to tear it apart. And they take another thing, and they try to tear it apart, and take it in all different kinds of directions. So you're left constantly defending yourself. That's what they love doing. So Allah says, فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةً That even if there is clearly between you and himself in particular, there seems to be animosity. Between him and you there is now animosity. I mean, the, the discussion has gotten so heated that it's become clear that this guy doesn't just disagree with you, he actually hates you. He hates you. Like, listen, hate in his face, in his eyes, in his words. And it's becoming clear. The hatred is just spewing out. And when that happens, you still have to respond, right? So Allah says, Ka annahu waliyul hameem. Then at that point, you have to think of him as a friend who would protect you. And you have to think of him as your closest, most intimate buddy when you talk to him. Imagine that it's not a guy who hates your guts. You need to imagine this is your closest friend. Wali is used, the kind of friend that you would want by you when you're in a fight. What is a friend who has the urge and the intention and the motive to protect you? You need to you need to pretend that guy's got your back instead of attacking you. And you need to pretend he's Hamim to you. Hamim comes from Himma. Himma means fever. Himma literally means fever. And you know why that's used here? Because there are some friends, even thinking about them warms your blood and you feel closeness. There's a love that comes in, takes over you. I miss that friend of mine. There are some friends of yours. You know, I live in Texas now, some of my closest friends are in New York. Even their name comes on the like, oh, I miss that guy. I used to do all kinds of pranks with him, and, you know, I used to mess with him so much. I can't mess with anybody anymore, they might sue me, or, you know. You know Texas has a lot of guns. You know? <laughs> you know, there are actual signs in Texas. This daddy to internalize something almost humanly impossible. He is asking the daddy to internalize the guy in front of you is hateful, it's become clear that he's hateful, but to you, you have to pretend that he is your protective, intimate, close buddy, your friend. And then Allah Himself says, وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَلَوْا No, no, no. This is not accomplished by people at all, except people who truly have salah. Allah recognizes Himself, this ain't for everybody. This ain't for you. If, it, if, if you don't have salah, stay out of da'wah. I'm serious. Da'wah is not for everyone. It's not. If you don't have the patience for this kind of ethic, don't put yourself in that position. You will do more damage than good. And then he says, by the way, 
all of this is so difficult to do. So Allah says, those who can pull this off, and who can pull this off? It's this, will, this good patience and this power and this ability to respond to it better will never be met with, to, with anyone except people who have incredible fortune. They're really, truly fortunate with Allah. Why? Because when Allah gives you more difficult challenges, then the rewards are proportionately higher. So he says, this is for very, very lucky, very fortunate people who can pull this off, you know? Now he says, In the middle of that heated debate, if shaitan comes and pokes at you, and if he wants you to respond and forget that you're looking at a friend, and you look at him as an enemy just like he looks you as an enemy, and you get heated yourself, then at that time seek the refuge of Allah. And then he says, إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ No, 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 he! He's the one listening, he's the one who knows. In other words, you forget the person in front of you, all you can think of is Allah because he mentioned himself twice. Look at the power and the perfection and the eloquence of the Quran where a difficult challenge was mentioned, Allah mentioned, إِنَّهُ سَمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ where a way more difficult challenge was mentioned, إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ because in that challenge you have to recognize Allah's presence to back off. You will not be able to back off on your own. There will be something that switches off inside of you, there's an animal part of us, the gear that just clicks and you go into hyper aggressive mode and you turn into someone else. The only people who can back off from that are people who recognize Allah's presence. Let me give you a psychological example of that. You're about to get really angry with your younger brother and your dad walks in. Why are you? What will you turn into? It happens or no? You recognize your father's presence and you realize, oh, wait, wait, I, yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> what were you saying? No, nothing, nothing. <laughs> you understand? When you recognize the authority's presence, something in you changes immediately. You are about to be angry, but you're like, oh, mm, I know I get in trouble if I say anything now. <laughs> Allah reminds you of himself at the right moment. The purpose of this, this talk was to illustrate a couple of things. In the, in the study of the wisdom of the Qur'an, in the study of the lessons drawn from the Qur'an, I, I tell you, the more I study it, the more I realize we haven't even scratched the surface. There are so many gems and so many treasures that need to be extracted from this book simply by reflection. And when I try to study this stuff with, you know, with uh, tafasir and other lexical resources and things like that, I realize the things that people could use immediately, the practical stuff, it's scattered in volumes and volumes of books. You read four pages and then you read one line that's like epic. You're like, oh, snap, why did I have to read four pages of nothing for this? You know? But it's there, but it's so scattered. And it's, a, a, it's an undertaking in and of itself to pull that stuff out and put it in one place so that we can have, we can extract these gems, you know? Because so, for so many, the Quran simply became an academic exercise. It's a living text. It's giving us advice for what we're going through right now. The other reason I gave you this particular example is because when people think of the attack of shaitan, they think of uh, drugs, alcohol, you know, partying, illicit relationships. That's where shaitan's at work. Let me tell you, shaitan's at work from the top to the bottom. Like, you know, some people start thinking, well, if I become a good person, I start praying and stuff, or I start learning Islam and talking to people about Islam, then shaitan will leave me alone because you know, I'm good now. Uh, no. The worst attacks of shaitan are mentioned in the Quran for people who are trying to go on the straight path. The people who are headed down the wrong path are on basically cruise control from shaitan. He says, down with it, you have your fun. <laughs> You're already on cruise control heading towards, you know, the fire, so I'm going to work on these guys over here and help them make a U-turn. You understand? <laughs> and if any of you turns around and then shaitan comes back at you once again. How much time have I got left? Five minutes, okay. I can wrap this up in five minutes, inshallah. Okay, so now uh, a last thing. This is unrelated to these two ayat, but I hope you, you benefited from that discussion, inshallah. Surah Al-A'raf and Surah al for your reference. Now I want to tell you about one of the one of the, the ways in which Shaitan got our parents. If you really want to understand Shaitan properly, you need to be you need to see where his career began. His career began with messing with our parents, Adam and Hawa, Salamun Alayhima. And if you really want to understand that, you have to study Surah Al-A'raf. The seventh surah, Surah Al-A'raf, Allah mentions what he did and his strategy in detail. He accounts step by step by step how he worked his way to get our parents out of Jannah, and therefore, by extension, how he's working to keep us out of Jannah. Once he got them out, he wants to keep us out, right? So now, of the many things, because that's a long passage, and it's incredible stuff. 
Like every one of those steps is a discussion by itself. But I will mention just one of those steps to you. And that one step is فَدَلَّهُمَا بِغُرُورُ Dalla in Arabic is a verb. Tadliya as an infinitive, the verb is actually used when you have a bucket and you have a roll attached to the bucket and you pull the bucket slowly. Little by little by little by little. If you pull it immediately, it's adla. Adla. If you pull it slowly, then it's dalla. Now in the case of Yusuf alayhi salam, he was in the bottom of a well and they pulled the bucket up and ch a, a boy came out. You remember the story? So the ayah says, فَأَدْلَى دَلْوَى فَأَدْلَى دَلْوَى means it came up rather quickly. Now you and I know a boy is not that light. So it would take still a while to pull it up, right? So that's adla. But when shaitan is described figuratively as he took this, he took Adam and Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and he yanked them out like a bucket is pulled up out of a well using deception. But Allah uses the word dalla, meaning he took his sweet time. Like a boy pulling, being pulled out of the well would take a few minutes too. But shaitan took a lot longer than that to pull them out of Jannah. In other words, he didn't just go there and say, hey, that fruit? Oh, <laughs> just do it. Just do it. Come on. And that was it. And then our friends were like, okay, sounds like a good idea. Like, no, 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 no. He did what was on. He came to them. He came to them. First time they caught it. Then he came again. Then he came again. Then he came again. Then he came at night. Then he came in the morning. They said, hey, you hungry? Yeah. Hey, so I know there's one tree. I imagine she, uh, the Jannah has countless trees. Countless trees. Jannah is way bigger than this earth. Allah says, you know, its, skies is the, its, its size is the skies of the earth combined. Then he says, Its size is maybe somewhat comparable to the skies of the earth, meaning it's even bigger than the skies of the earth. It's even bigger than that. So how many trees in Jannah? And Allah calls it Jannah, which means every bit of it is covered with green or trees. So the entire span of more than what we know of the constantly expanding universe is covered with trees. So how easy is it to find one haram tree? <laughs> you can think about that. Of all the trees in the entire universe of Jannah, there is one that is haram, and shaitan had to first of all GPS them back to that one tree. <laughs> Little by little, no, take this turn, why don't you go over here? Why don't you go, everyone check that out, check, that, check the strawberries, those look pretty good, don't they? And he did, so he didn't call them to the haram necessarily. Dalla suggests, he called them to something. Now, are all the other trees haram? No. no. All the other trees are not haram. But he's not even directly saying go to that tree, he's saying go to this one. Now go to that mountain, check out this waterfall, and go over here, and go over here. And they're going and they think this has nothing to do with what? A larger plan. They don't see it, that this is part of a larger plan. And Allah is teaching us that's exactly what shaitan does. So what does he do with you? He tempts you into doing something. And when you do it, at first, it's not haram. I mean, it's not totally haram. <laughs> at least I'm not doing it, and then you can fill in the blank with your creativity. Because when kids get caught, they say, at least I did it, and then they, you know, right? But he only wanted to get you to the first milestone. Because from there, he will work on you for a month or two to get you to the second milestone. And then to the third milestone. And then to the fourth milestone. Eventually, you will be doing the very thing you said early on, at least I'm not doing... You'll be doing that. But he won't get to you immediately. <laughs> he will work on you slowly. He'll work on you slowly. He'll work, uh, he'll, he'll work on a guy and a girl to develop an you know, illegitimate relationship slowly. First, they'll just see each other in the bazaar. <laughs> At the Islamic book stall. <coughs> oh, you like that tafsir too? Oh, I love that tafsir. <laughs> yep. Yep. I love it because you, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> oh, you love that surah too? Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, it's the last copy, or I'll let you buy it. It's okay, please. It's innocent. It's nothing. It's okay. Alhamdulillah. He said, Salaamu Alaikum. Is that my little son? He 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 did he did. I was all innocent at first, and then just a little bit. Hey, ah, uh, do you know Abu Karim? Well, yes, I do know Abu Karim. You know? Oh, okay, I know him too. And if somebody comes and says, "Hey, you can't say do you know Abu Karim?" Oh, is it haram? I can't even ask who Abu Karim is. Is it haram to talk to a brother at all? No, I can't tell you that it's haram. But you know what Shaitan's doing? Just a little. 
Oh. So are you on Facebook? Well, of course I am. Actually, I already looked you up. And then you'll say, but well, we're just texting. We're not doing anything else. We're just on WhatsApp together. That's all. It was just a picture. It wasn't a video. It was just a picture. It'll be one justification, then another justification. It's just a dinner. It's with the whole MSA. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. How do you know that? <laughs> One thing to another, to another, to another. Then I get the phone call. Brother Naman, do you have a couple of minutes? I want to talk to you. What's her name, bro? <laughs> you know, well, you know, the Shaitan, the Bahama people, he got it. Now I really want to marry her, but I'm 14 years old. And... <laughs> like girls, there's no hiding it, they do. And Shaitan knows that better than you. He does. And you know what? You know what else? The way, you know how people like to dress provocatively now? Like if I go to Target or Walmart or any other store to even buy my kids some, some clothes, I can't find these clothes anymore for my girls. They're like 9, 10, you know, 8 years, 7 years old. I can't go to the store and buy any decent clothes. I have to go to the boys section to find sweatpants for them. <laughs> Mothers here know what I'm talking about because they, they make horrible clothes like like, I, I can't even say it on stage kinds of clothes for kids now. Because they're trying to sexualize children. They're trying to do this, right? Now when you see that, when you, when you walk through the aisle of the kids' section, you know what I think of it as, by the way, they do this in the toy section. In the toy section, back in the day, Barbie, long dress, you know, and now brass, shorter and shorter skirts, more and more huge lips with makeup on them, right? With like eyeliner and all of it. You know, brats. You see the brats? Right? And they're, they're selling like hotcakes. Those things go. I, I actually experiment with my children. When I take my girls sometimes to the toy store, I put a brat in the cart. I'm like, take that out, it's disgusting. I was like, why is it disgusting? Because I say it's disgusting, or you think it's disgusting? Explain to me why it's disgusting. I like it. <laughs> I, think, I think it's nice. Don't you think we should give this to your younger sister? No, what? no, this is wrong. Why is it wrong? Explain it to me. You have to stand up for yourself and explain it to me. I don't want to hear an artificial answer. Because sometimes kids tell you what you want to hear. I want to know how you're thinking. Why is this wrong? Why is this bad? You know? And I have to teach them how to articulate themselves. But anyway, I, I mentioned this to you because the, one of the earliest, earliest attacks of Shaitan, this is when he was beginning his career. He wanted us, he wanted our parents to eat from the tree. You remember? How much time you got left? <laughs> He wanted us to eat from the, the, our parents to eat from the tree. You recall this? Allah mentions with Lam al -ta It's called Lam al -ta Lam al -ta means the reason why he wanted us to eat from the tree. The, the, uh, the Lam will explain why. He says, He wanted them to go to the tree and eat from the tree so that he could expose to each of them what was covered of their ugliness. He wanted them to lose their clothes. He wanted them to be provocative in front of each other. This is what he wanted. This, is, this was, was his way of humiliating, because Adam السلام, was honored, and what better way to humiliate someone but than to remove their clothes? You know? And he wanted that for both our mother and our father. What is happening in the world of design? What is happening in the world of entertainment? How are you justifying yourself watching television shows that have, the following has sexual content. You're like, oh, it's just some sexual content. It's just some. <laughs> I can forward it. You know? I can skip that part. I just see the first second of it. Then I'll say astaghfirullah. Then I'll watch it again when nobody else is there. <laughs> it's disgusting. But this is what Shaitan has done. And he knew that human beings will lose their dignity if they lose their clothes. And now we are living in times where losing the clothing is celebrated. It's just celebrated. Why are guys working out if they're going to stay dressed? You can, you can tell me you're working out because you want to be healthy, but there are plenty of other exercises you can do, but you want to build certain muscles of your body because eventually you want to find an excuse where somebody sees you. It's sad. Even guys. Even guys. A, a girl, you know. Why are they? There are, there are girls that are dressed 
And they, they want to tell themselves they're dressed Islamically. They're, they're covered, head to toe. But covering isn't just the Islamic code of dress. It's about protecting, covering what Allah beautified within you. So if you're, co if you're covered head to toe, but you're wearing skin-tight clothes, you know, or you're drawing attention to certain parts of your body with the way, the kinds of clothes you're wearing, you know. You don't, don't kid yourself. You know. And I'm talking to you like your older brother. I'm not, uh, not going to you know, beat around the bush. It is like it is. My daughters have to hear this from me too. So I'm not going to come and talk to you like just a, a formal lecture. Somebody might get offended. Look, I'll tell you like it is. You're 14, 15 years old. You're 16 years old, 17 years old. Eight, there's no reason you should be dressing like that. There's no reason. And don't kid yourself if you're wearing it in and I'm not going to call you out if you're walking by, hey, that's better or whatever. I'm not going to call you out, but this is my opportunity to call you out. And nobody else can call you out. You have to call yourself out. You have to stop letting shaitan trick you into thinking, this is your way of looking beautiful. This is not. This is not. This is sad. This is what it's people who don't have anything higher to find meaning in. This is what they find meaning in. I'm not saying you shouldn't dress nicely. Girls have a natural tendency to want to dress nicely. Guys can look like homeless people and they're fine. Girls, girls have a thing. They want to dress nicely. That's fine. You know, I wouldn't dress like this if my mom didn't tell me. I, just, I wouldn't do it. You know. So my mom said, I said, I I said, I'm like, okay, mom, I'll dress up. Okay, okay. You can go like that? Like that? Go like that? I was like, okay, mom. All right. Fine. I'll dress like a human. But, but girls want to look pretty. That's fine. You know what? Cool. That's cool. No problem. Allah even says when he revealed clothing, he said warisha, and it means to look well, look nice. He did. But not provocative, and you are smart enough to know the difference, and please don't pretend you don't. You do. You know very well. And your mother calls you out on it too. Your mother calls you out and says, Mom, come on, don't say that. You're embarrassing me. No, she's not embarrassing you. She's giving you a reality check. The shaitan's messing with you, and your mom's trying to help you out. Don't dress like that, don't dress like this. And then there are the sad situations in our families where the mother tells the daughter, take the hijab off. Why is your jabab so loose? Why can't you get a tighter one? That will look nicer. You know? There are those sad, disgusting situations. That needs to stop. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know, I know. Let me pick on the boys now and you can go. <laughs> so that was one trickery of shaitan that I wanted to highlight for the young ladies, for the young men, just very quickly. One of the meanings of the word shaitan, shaba, is halaka wa ihtarak. Actually, ihtarak wa halak, which means he got set on fire. Literally, to be set on fire. It's used as a figure of speech in Arabic for losing one's temper. So you justify your misbehavior by losing your temper and storming out of a conversation. And then you still do what you do. So your mom says, stop playing video games. Forget it! <laughs> and you just walk away. So you now your mother's like, ah, don't be so angry. It's okay, come back, come back. No, mom. You're always interrupting my very important, you know, purpose in life. <laughs> you know, or is it half-life? I don't know what the game is called. <laughs> you, you hide, you justify your misbehavior by just acting all tough. So nobody can correct you. Anybody tries to give you advice, you're like, hey! <laughs> Alright, whatever, whatever, I'm not coming back. I don't need this, you know. This is shaitan. That's shaitan. When you're incapable of taking advice, incapable of being corrected, just you get flared up. You just get flared up. I gave khutbah yesterday, I was really happy with myself. I gave khutbah, and usually my khutbahs don't make any sense. Yesterday it made sense, I thought. <laughs> it made sense, you know. I was like, okay, alhamdulillah, this one might well. Uncle comes up to me and says, your khutbah made no sense at all. <laughs> It had no content, and I did not understand anything you were saying. It was completely impractical. It was terrible. You have an obligation to speak clearly in front of the youth. You did not connect with the youth at all. I thought your khutbah was terrible. And I listened to that, and I said, okay, do you have any suggestions? And he said, yeah, I have lots of suggestions. And my family was waiting downstairs. They're in the car, kids getting cranky and all that. I just sat with the uncle for 30 minutes, and he gave me suggestions, and I wrote them. I literally wrote them. I put them in my phone, like I don't want to save them, and I have them. And I disagree with some of them, but I agree with some of them. You have to learn to take criticism. It's okay. I did not say, excuse me, are you on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, don't get heated when somebody corrects you. Chill out. 
Just accept it. Take it. They're probably right, because you're guys. <laughs> you know? So I, I pray that we're able to combat the attacks of shaitan and raise ourselves to the point, you know? We have to become those people. May Allah Azza wa Jalla elevate all of us in our status, and may Allah Azza wa Jalla take the good of what is said and forgive the wrong that is said. Barakallahu